So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the weekly energy show hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now here's Barry. Welcome to segment two of our energy show episode with Scott Sullivan. We pick up the discussion with suggestions for selecting a solar and storage company, as well as advice for solar companies as they navigate the changing energy industry landscape. So, Scott, what you've seen over the years, what are the characteristics of a great solar and storage installation company or contractor? What makes them really good? And then what should customers look for when they're selecting a contractor? Wow. I wish, I hope and I hope and pray every single homeowner in America listens to this show today because the choice of who they pick is going to make the difference. It's like night and day, right? So making sure that the homeowner is educated. We are dealing with the most educated homeowner now than we've ever have been before. I mean, I have customers call me up and say, well, before I have you guys come out and talk to me, what's your price per watt? <laughs> what? what? You know, that just 20 years ago, they didn't know what a solar panel was and they couldn't spell inverter. And now they're asking me what my installed price per watt is. So we're dealing with a much more educated consumer, which is great. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, it is really great because if we have to spend less time talking about this is what a solar panel is and this is what an inverter does. Now we can talk about the economics and how you're going to use that energy. What I think a great solar contractor is there's two sides to that there's a great solar sales company and there's a great solar contractor let's start with the sales company the sales company that is truly consultative the sales company that comes in and asks the right questions mr cinnamon do you own an ev yes okay are you thinking about putting using your ev to power your house i didn't know i could do that those are the types of questions you know going from vehicle to grid going from you know, virtual power plants, making sure that, you know, you own a Ford Lightning, you know, is it worth spending 12 grand to have the switch gear so you can power your whole house off of the 98 kilowatt hours battery that you have in your truck? The answer is yes. (laughs) You know, so those are the questions that a true, really, really good sales company will ask. They do a consultative sale and they dig in deep. And if the customer gets antsy and says, why are you asking me all these questions? How much is it? Then that's not your right customer. That's not your good avatar. That's a guy who's probably a price buyer or thinks he can buy solar on Amazon and have it delivered tomorrow. Yep. yep. Right? Yeah. So then we shift to the contractor side. The contractor side is the guy who treats your home just even better than he would treat his own right? Mm -hmm. He comes in, he's respectful. He brings the proper safety equipment. He makes it absolutely clear that you're the priority. I'm not on the phone. I'm in uniform. I have my security equipment. I have a responsible crew that are doing exactly what they said. They're communicating through the entire process. You know, Mr. Cinnamon, we have on the plans here that this Solar array is going to go right here, but we found there's a vent pipe there. You know, we want to have this conversation with you before we just mow over it, right? Or before we put a snorkel on it or whatever, you know, nobody is going to know what that means. Sorry, I forgot my audience. But, you know, that's what it makes a good contractor. And then the continuous communication. Most anybody that's listening to this right now knows that, that they bought solar It is weeks, sometimes months, sometimes a very long time before they go from the signed contract to a permission to operate from the utility. The great contractor keeps that customer informed all the way through. The great contractor over communicates. Mr. Cinnamon, I know it's Friday. No, we don't have any updates. We're still waiting on your plans and permits. Hey, how was your week? (laughs) You know, that call does wonders. And then when they show up and they do the right job, and it's all about making sure that you're happy, you're satisfied, 
that you're reasonable and I'm reasonable. We're doing a great job. You're trading your time and money for my efforts to save you money. So it works out really well. I think that's the answer. I don't know if you agree totally. I totally agree. Communication is the one of the hardest things to do. It takes staffing. It takes systems to do it. And candidly, we could do a better job sometimes because we're not always proactively calling the customer. The biggest delay is when the cities get the permit application and they, they kind of can sit on it for months. And we're usually the bad guys about that. We're the ones that are blamed for it, but it's not us. Luckily, people have a lot more tolerance for bad behavior from their utility. So yeah, everybody hates the utility. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. Because we're in Southern California and there's a lot of, lot of filmmakers, a lot of Hollywood, a lot of stuff going on. We actually had a client that was almost six months waiting for the utility and the city to get through the final inspection and fire, Mm -hmm. LAFD and all that other stuff. He walks in with a video camera and says to the guy, the little lady behind the counter saying, can you explain to me why I've been waiting six months and can I speak to your supervisor? I mean, it's like, you know, and they know who he was. Or she, yeah. yeah. And it's amazing. It does get very frustrating sometimes. But thank goodness that IR was not geared towards us because they knew that we had no choice in the map. Yeah, makes sense. Scott, since Sunrun and Solar City started back in the 2007 timeframe, financing has been key to the growth of solar. There are leases and PPAs, which are called third party ownership. It's a, another corporate entity owns the panels on your roof. And that gives them some extra tax advantages and can reduce costs. And then there's also loans and home equity lines that were very, very popular, especially when interest rates were lower. But what does the residential solar financing landscape look like now that interest rates have kind of gone up and they haven't started coming down yet? It's brutal. There's no other way to describe it. It's really tough right now. It eats up any savings that you could have for lowering by putting glass on your roof and generating your own power just feet above you it eats up that savings because you're paying it to somebody else right now a ppa a power purchase agreement where a power purchase agreement or lease makes sense is if a homeowner or a business does not have a tax appetite because if you're either now with the ira there's even you know, now they'll write you a check, you know, they'll actually write you a check. But until recently, until this last COVID crisis and all the other stuff that happened, if you didn't have a tax appetite, you weren't eligible for the 30% tax credit. So it ended up being a tough way to get that credit to buy down the cost. So very smart people started financing and saying, hey, I'll give you 20% or 25% of that, and then you just let me own it, and I'll take the tax right off, and I'll put in the debt and the equity, and I'll build it all up, and I'll give it to you, and it doesn't cost you anything, and I'll fixate your price just a little bit, just a little bit more than what you would do if you owned it. So if you owned it, and you could generate electricity at six or seven cents per kWh. I'll sell you your power for seven and a half cents per kWh, and then guess what? You're locked in for 20 years. You save money. I've fixated your rate. There may or may not be an escalator in there. You have to be careful. Read the fine print. And then at the end of the term, you can either own it, renew it, buy it for fair market value, blah, 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 all those things. So those financial vehicles made a huge, a huge difference before the IRA and before, you know, all of the tax things that have been happening. So it was a big boom for the industry because- I even want to say, I want to go a step further and say it gave us credibility. You know, remember when you can first lease a car before when you and I were kids, it's like you save your money, you go into your dealership, your local dealership, you couldn't buy a car any other way. There was no such thing as the internet. Sorry, I know you're old like me. And you write the guy a check and he gives you a car. Then they came out and they said, okay, now we'll finance it, but you can only get three years and we make payments. Then somebody came up with this brilliant idea. We'll just lease it. And now the lease became a vehicle, no pun intended, it became a financial vehicle that you could actually write it off on your taxes and you could lease the vehicle and drive it for practically free. 
and the it, car industry just took off, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a little uh, jolt there is that General Motors Acceptance Corporation, which was their financing arm, was making more money on yeah, the financing GMAC. than they were on making the cars. I don't know how it is exactly. right now, but you know, they just found another way to make money, which is fine. And guess what? Same thing's happening within the solar industry. You've got mm, companies. Sunrun. Yep. They make their profits on the financing. They could do the installation for right. you know zero money or even negative because they're going to make it up, not in volume, you're going to make it up on financing. And that's a darn good and, business model. And there's something to be said. I mean, you know, hey, buy now, buy today, buy now. There's zero money out of pocket. Come on, we'll put solar on your house tomorrow for free. Just yep. call us. Call 1-800-555-1212. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you it's... know, and then it's like you call and they send a really professional salesperson out and says, oh, you don't want to own it. It's a maintenance nightmare. Let us own it. We'll take care of it. And guess what? If it doesn't produce power, you don't owe us a cent. We'll take care of it. We'll keep it running. But every single kilowatt hour it makes, you have to pay us seven and a half cents. So we become your electric company at a cheaper rate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and it works. And you know it's a little challenging. All right, let's change gears a little bit. We okay. talked about the financing. Let's talk about potential new channels to sell a lot of solar and storage. So I'm wondering what you think about the utility virtual power plants that are out there. And then I think coming down the road, the utility V to G or vehicle to grid programs. Um, yeah. I haven't seen a lot of traction on that in California, although there's some tests, but what are you seeing around the country? So I think the Ford Lightning is going to change that, right? I really do. I mean, the Ford Lightning, maybe to some extent, Elon with the Cybertruck, not as much, but the Ford Lightning is 100% geared for that market. I pull my Ford Lightning up at night, plug it in, the power goes off, it switches, and now my truck is powering my house, right? It's that simple. It literally is that simple. So I think that that day is coming, right? And I also think that the day is coming, when you talk about the virtual power plant, that to me Nothing good comes from the utility owning that. What I think happens is you didn't actually say the word community solar, but it's got the same vibe, the virtual power plant. I know where you live in the Campbell area. I know what's going on down there. You probably have a great homeowners association. I know I do. So if my homeowners association came to me and said, we are going to eliminate your electric bill, but you're going to stay connected to the grid for security. But we're going to pool our money and our time. And in that five acres behind the, our subdivision, we're going to fill that with solar. And I'm going to give you green energy. And you only need to buy from the grid if everybody in the subdivision is using too much power that day for air conditioning. We're going to use them as a backup. I would say, sign me up. I'm ready to go. Right? Privately held privately organized, privately sold, privately developed, that's the way to go. The problem with the utility is you have the word utility in there, right? So the virtual power plant that the utility owns in, you know, Colma, Mexico, and they're wheeling the power across the border and selling it to, you know, the fine residents of PG&E territory, that doesn't solve our problem. We're still moving those electrons thousands of miles. We're still moving those electrons through massive amounts of infrastructure with giant aluminum wire for at 500,000 volts. None of that's good. Yeah. None of that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I was funny, you know, talking about these utility virtual power plants. And this was from Utility Dive. There's a newsletter that I get. This is Utility yeah. Dive. The quote. Because the vast majority of utilities in the United States earn a fixed rate of return on their capital investments, they are not incentivized to implement solutions which will save them and ultimately ratepayers money. That's what right. they quoted. Now, I'm translating that into English. Utilities only want to do things if it's going to add to their asset base because they get a 10% exactly. guaranteed rate of return on right. every building, every truck, every trench, every pile of batteries in the neighborhood. And... They get a 12% guaranteed rate of return on net assets. So you see all these utilities saying it's only two cents a kilowatt hour to put solar and batteries in our own production facilities. And there's batteries there. You got power at night. But then the rates are 40 cents a kilowatt hour to homeowners. The reason is I think it's $10 million a mile to put those underground transmission lines in. And so yeah. it's a hundred billion dollars. It's laughable for PG to do all that, but the public utilities commissions kind of go along with it. And so this whole structure 
of power plants that are owned by the utilities is going to bankrupt the state and they can't possibly build them fast enough. I mean, it was just kind of keeping up with all vehicles electric by 2035, heat pump installations, just general growth of the population. And now put on top of that, there's these news articles about how AI processing is going to require a tremendous amount of electricity. We're just not going to be able to produce that power. It takes 10 years to build these transmission lights. It takes two years to build the solar plant, but 10 years to build the wires that you need and it's going to be expensive. So, yeah, we're going to see what happens. I keep coming back, and when I ran the numbers for all the transmission lines that PG&E wants to spend, it's cheaper to put solar in storage on every single sunny roof in California than it is to do what the utilities want, just to build the transmission lines that will right. burn cities down. I think we should be scared, though, if the utility realizes what you just said. If somebody smart enough at the utility says, oh, I'll just put solar on every single ratepayer's house, and I'll take the power. I'll just rent their roof from them. That would be scary because I just don't want them to get smart enough. A friend of mine was on the board at pg and and I was talking to him about that for commercial buildings. And he said you know, they ran the numbers. They would have to spend too much money to, quote, lease the roof compared to the profits they would get. So they do not want that business because okay, they good. make way more money. As long as they've got a compliant public utilities commission, compliance is basically fueled by but, a lot of, of money that they donate. They make way more money that way. Well, let's talk about the other thing that you mentioned during the course of that, you know, vehicle to grid and VPP. But I think the way we win, the way solar wins, the way renewable energy wins, the way the human race wins, the way the Americans win, is that if you go back we're not quite old enough, but right at our childhood, in the rural America, they did not have indoor plumbing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go back 60, 70 years, there are places in America that were not electrified and did not have indoor plumbing. And then building codes changed, and then infrastructure changed, and then clean water acts were passed. And all of a sudden, you know, houses were now being built plumbed with gas, electrified, plumbed with clean water, plumbed with sewer. There weren't septic tanks. There weren't, I mean, all of these things were changing even in rural America. So I think where we win, and I don't, please, I don't want any more legislation. I'm a small government guy, right? You know, small D. Let's just, let's just tamp down the government. I mean, we don't need legislation, but we need common sense. How about build every house and have it stubbed in for batteries? Build every house stubbed in for an electric vehicle. Why? Because there's a 75% chance in the next 10 years you're going to own one. Yeah. Right? Oh, Why not go ahead and just pre-wire and stub every house in for solar? Even better yet, how about when you are a subcontractor, if you're a home builder, if you're Lamar, I, I'm not calling anybody out. So please, I got buddies that work at Lamar. I got buddies that work at Colwell. All those home builders that buy a tract of land, instead of racing to the bottom to see how cheap you can build it and how much margin you can make, how about building more efficient homes? How about making sure they have solar, making sure they have solar thermal, making sure that they have a battery, making so that if we start doing that, and people, I remember, you and I remember when the MLS, when you sold a house, you couldn't check the box that says, I only want a house with solar. The MLS today, if you and I are buying the house, we can go to the MLS listing and we go, show me only houses that have solar. Yeah. Right? And they'll just pop up. Just like I can go to an app on my phone now and I can say, show me blue trucks that are for sale today. So smart people that care are going to be able to change this world by just making it available. If we all put solar and batteries and solar thermal and everything at the time we build the house, I read somewhere it adds less than $2 a month on a 30-year mortgage. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And then everything you say makes total, rational, big picture sense. And then you see what happened over the past few weeks where the fossil fuel yeah. industry overturned the ban on uh, natural gas hookups in Berkeley and exactly. elsewhere. And so, you know, there's those incumbent industries that have a ton of money and they'll fight these lawsuits forever. But gradually, 
uh, you know, I'm a big believer in superior economics and, you know, it's going to cost more for us to dig up those gas lines and take them out or just cap them. And at the same time, put in a bigger electric service. It's going to cost more, but that will eventually, it'll eventually change. And we're, we're if you're we listening, that. if you're listening to the sound of our voice right now and you happen to be a billionaire, Bezos, you know, anybody, if you happen to be a billionaire and you want to change the world, would you please call Barry and Scott? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. They, you know, think about doing the right things and we'll, the, your money to work for really sustainable. We changes. really don't need a colony on Mars yet. We need cheaper power here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. We're, we're talking right. about big pictures, big changes. Let's get down to the drill down all the way to the, the bottom. Scott, you've been in solar a long, long time. What do you do for fun? Oh, wow. So my wife and I love to travel. I have been very blessed. Solar has offered me, I have been involved in almost 16 gigawatts of power installation, and I have installed solar in 22 countries, including wow. Serbia, Croatia, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, of course, Germany, UK. So we love to travel. I love the opportunity to go and meet with, I mean, we did a, a remote island in the Philippines that there was no power on the island at all. And they wanted to put in a little one megawatt ground mount so that they could power all the homes in the entire island. And I was just blessed enough to be part of that. So we love to travel. My wife and I are also movie files. COVID really put a cramp on that. But we used to have a date night. I've been with my wife for a very long time. And I know you and Christy have been together for a long time too. But it's like every Friday night for for decades, we would go to the movies and see whatever the new movie was coming out. Because we like the movie theater experience, right? Yeah, well, life changes, COVID comes, and then you build a theater room at your house. And now it's like, yeah, I don't ever go out anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I've got a great big, huge room with a great big, huge TV and really comfortable chairs and 17 streaming services. And I have fiber to the desk. I'm bringing fiber optic cable right to my desk so I can stream movies and, and, and get a pop, crazy popcorn fat. machine and everything you need. Exactly. Yeah. So but we still love a good movie. I'm not as voracious of a reader as I used to be because, God help us, I have to wear these every day now. So, but used to read all the time on the planes, and now I listen to books on tape. So I love to continue learning, but that's what we do for fun. We got two beautiful grandsons that I love to death. I got three grown kids that are all productive members of society. I mean... I don't know what else you could want out of life, right? You know, I, I have lots of philanthropic things that my wife and I do, and we love it. We're very active in our church. I tell you what, have you ever been to a hotel room and you open the drawer and there's a Bible in the drawer? Gideon. Gideon. I've been a Gideon for 22 years. Yep, yep. So I'm very, very active in the Gideons, and I that's kind of what I like to do to give back. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. I really am a joyful guy. There's a big difference between being happy and being joyful. I get up every morning and decide to be joyful. I'm not always happy, but I decide to be joyful. So I just get up and I just love life. And, you know, I'm, I am just a guy that likes to meet people and have a conversation. You know, it's funny. I'm just thinking about the other people in the solar industry and, and related industries that I've interviewed. And we all, we, I'm the same way. Just, we just yeah. like our life's work. We like our jobs. We like seeing how that the employees mature and grow and build families and how much value we're creating to society. So that, that's exactly. kind of bottom line. All right. How can people get in touch with you, Scott? Yeah, I'm really, really difficult. I'm very, no. <laughs> if you type Scott Sullivan on LinkedIn, I'll probably pop up three different ways. I have over 98,000 connections on LinkedIn. So you can go to Scott Sullivan.biz, Scott, my full name, Scott Sullivan.biz, because some guy named Scott Sullivan got .com years ago and I haven't been able to get it from him. I've tried several times to buy it, but right. Scott Sullivan.biz, it's really easy to get a hold of me. I'm If you go to any of my socials, anywhere else. I actually have my cell phone number on there. I've had the same cell phone number since 1999. Wow. Wow. And my wife and I are one digit apart. We got our cell phones the same day from AT&T a million years ago. And we walked in and this is back. You remember when the, the cell phones were like the little Nokia 
Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you could play Snake on them. I mean, yeah, you know, that yeah. kind of, whatever. It's a 1999. It was, there was no, it was just out of a bag phone. I mean, it just got past a bag phone. So my last four digits are 5668. Six, Hers are 5669. Six, and we have had the same cell phones since 1999. Yeah, yeah. I did the same thing, believe it or not. And my ex-wife has the same number plus one than me. And, you know, it goes back to the same genre. But, you know, it, it shows stability. All right. Thanks. Scott, tremendous. Thanks for joining me on this week's Energy Show. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if anybody listening missed any of the show, you can always go to the Energy Show website at energyshow.biz. There's the .biz again. And listen to the podcast. Thank you very much.